A very good evening and a warm welcome to the program. Tonight uh, we look into health matters and we're speaking about lupus. And I'd like to introduce my guest for this evening, Mariam Naseje, who is a 35-year-old mother of two. She is a trained teacher but is currently freelancing as a customer service excellence trainer. Mariam, thank you for joining us. Thank you for having me, Josephine. And thank you for, for being willing to share your, your stories. So just a bit about uh, Mariam. In her early 20s, she was, you know, right out of university. You're working a couple of jobs. Yeah. And, you know, all of a sudden, your energy levels start dropping. And then your social circles start growing smaller. Mm -hmm. And then you're thinking something is, is not right. So I'd like us to start our conversation there with what was the first giveaway that your fatigue... Mm -hmm. how you were feeling tired all the time, um, that there was something wrong? Of course, as a young person fresh out of school, you have so many expectations. And as a teacher in this country, you have to do a couple of jobs, like really go around because you want a good life. And the more you work, the better the pay. Of course, it makes sense. And you're energetic and you're feeling good. And then, all of a sudden, you are, non, you are tired. Most of the time you're tired. You, you just want to go to work and go home and rest. Go to work and go home and rest. But then, your, your peers, this is the time when you're starting to make some money. You want to go out a bit over the weekend. And, but somehow, you can't manage. And you keep making, ex I'm tired, I'm tired. And everybody thinking, she's you, always tired, always tired. So the ones who are into the, let's go happen something, everything, every time, they fall off. And your circles. I mean, because you don't fit in. Of course not. Okay. Uh, you, you're, work, you're, you're working, you're working, you're running from, about, you're running around maybe four, three schools. And uh, you have uh, you have tests coming in, exams, everything that comes with teaching, and uh, teenagers, you know, very energetic. You are teaching an older class. Yeah. Okay. So um, they, there is a lot of energy needed. You need to put in a lot, and uh, mm. and that is at around the time my subjects were very practical. You need to really be engaged. What were you teaching? Uh, physics and math and. Nobody really uh, ex <laughs> likes these subjects, but you need to make it interesting. And somehow, most of the time, you're not being creative or productive. Okay. You are simply sleeping. There are a lot of people who like those subjects, though. But mm. So you're, you're feeling tired, and most of the time, you're losing your social networks. What yeah. did you decide? At what point did you say, there must be something wrong, and let me go check this out? Uh, I started bleeding, bleeding through the gums. So I visited a dentist and they couldn't seem to find anything wrong. And then it went away. But I was losing weight. I was fatigued. I had general body weakness, joint pains that would get really severe when it is either very cold or if it is too hot, your skin is crawling and you feel like tiny cuts, you know, when you go under the sun. So. It, it was confusing. And then when you do the tests, uh, you have fevers, really, really high fevers, they spike. You're thinking maybe malaria, it's not malaria, probably typhoid, it's not. not but you are losing weight at a very funny rate. And since you're not socializing, people take long to f see you. And when they see you, they're thinking, oh my God, what is wrong with you? Everybody can clearly see that there is something definitely wrong with you. So at that age, of course, now the question comes in, has she been reckless? Probably it's HIV. You are in your early 20s? Yes. You test and it is negative. And then somebody tells you, uh, uh, that lab, it, they might not be so good. Try this. Actually, I tried, um, I think I tried all the labs around one day gear. And then I went to Ebenezer. Actually, when I went to Ebenezer, I went with my dad. And there was nothing. So you're sick. You're not OK. You've cut down on the jobs. You cannot deliver. And probably you're holding on to one so that you can manage. And 
even that you yeah. fall off because you're not being productive at all like okay maybe you're a bit productive but not as at the level of your peers exactly yeah. so it doesn't it doesn't give back your students are not are missing out you are feeling unproductive you're not generally everything is slowly dying and still you do not have answers so you did malaria tests, typhoid tests, you did an HIV test as well, a couple of them. Several. Yeah. And it, none of these is giving you any results, but your body s is still, you know, going through the yeah. changes that it's going through. How did it affect you psychologically? I mean, I, I guess at a point you had to give up the jobs. Of course. Uh, I had to give up the jobs. And then when you have no medical explanation for being sick, it, we, African, I don't know whether it's the African setting, but d definitely is, you tend towards spiritualism. Oh, witchcraft. Yes, it is also a kind okay. of spiritualism. So you will, people will start to suggest, because you're out of a job, you probably back home, you can't afford to maintain yourself, you are sick, you cannot do for yourself as you used to. Even washing your underwear becomes a problem. There are times when mm, my fingers were so, so swollen, you would think I was boxing or do something or anything, but so swollen, tender, painful, you can't do anything for yourself. So you gravitate towards spiritualism. Now, somebody is going to suggest a pastor, somebody is going to suggest a shay, somebody is going to suggest a traditional healer. And trust me, it doesn't matter how r much resolve you have, at some point or another, you yeah. are going to try because... Everything is not working. No. You are you're trying to find answers. And if you're dealing, it's better to deal with something that you think maybe could probably be wrong than not to have anything to deal with at all. Yeah. So it affects you psychologically. And... Um, I know. All right, let's take a short break and we'll be right back. Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. We're speaking to Mariam. And um, it got a bit emotional there, a, a lot emotional there. I think you were going back to the times in, in the hospital. Do you want to tell us about that? Yeah, that was uh, sometime before the hospital, yes. Um, yeah, there was this uh, one time, my dad, I don't know, people were suggesting left, right, and everywhere else. And there was this um, gentleman, they told him to take me to, and he had asked for some money, you know. And I was bleeding. So the guy looks at me and says, there is definitely something wrong with this girl. There is something inside of her. We need to bleed her. And uh, my father looked at me, I think, and looked at the guy. I am bleeding. He wants to bleed me a little bit more. So he said, you know what? I think, I think we'll pass. He had paid for the treatment. And he told him, you know what? We'll not do this. I'd never seen my father cry. <laughs> he, he wanted cried. to bleed you, so to take like more blood. Cut you okay. and uh, put something in your skin. or So he refused. And, and I think at that point I knew the, that wasn't going to work because we had tried everything. So... What, what, what were your visits to um, maybe traditional healers and uh, uh, spiritual leaders like? Yeah. Of course, um, there is the... Most of the time, I was just sleeping. Somebody was doing the asking for me. Uh, my sisters, my dad, whoever would be available to come with me. So. Most of the time, of course, because of the exhaustion, even moving from my bed, getting ready to go anywhere, you'd be exhausted. So all I could do is, if you get somewhere, they tell you, do this. 
um, prayers that you pay maybe a certain fee to see uh, a pastor or a shade so that you can have some kind of spiritual intervention but you go home and nothing changes and the best at that point you're doing is managing the symptoms uh, the fatigue you sleep the pain you take painkillers um, just a constant but as you're going through all this your situation is getting worse you're losing weight hair loss now the friends are completely gone because they don't even know how to access you and people don't even know what is happening because they don't see you anymore and the ones who see you don't know what to say to you uh they they are trying their best as in uh, if you suggest uh josephine su suggested we could see somebody if she has a really good pastor a good shea or a good traditional healer y you try everything okay. because you 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 want you want some kind of relief so you're thinking, if I can get any kind of relief in whichever way, fine, I'll take it. So you have bleeding gums, mm -hmm. you have fevers, mm -hmm. joint pains, you have strange reactions to cold and, and heat, mm -hmm. hair loss, your memory is foggy at this point. Yes, at that point, your memory is really, really foggy. You are not aware what time of day it is because you are simply sleeping. It is the only relief, and uh, luckily, the sleep comes. It's not like you are insomniac and you cannot sleep. Mm -hmm. You really, really do sleep. Right. I'm going to assume that that episode with the person who asked to bleed you more was not really a doctor. Yeah, it was. Uh, so, what was your first hospital experience like? What, what what were they treating now, you for? Now, between the leaving the job, the fatigue, it was about slightly under a year. And then I really started bleeding really profusely through the gums. And I was very, very, very anemic. And even the taking me to the hospital, I, I, don't, I, don't, I, don't, I don't remember how I got to the hospital. But when I came to, all I know is that I was in Zambia. And they were trying, t they ha I think I had been transfused and uh, just about coming to, in and out really, the sleep was a constant still, but we weren't sure. Uh, so my, I, I, had at <laughs> I had plated a really, really long weave, eh, you know, <laughs> uh, trying to maintain uh, the appearances and everything else, but I could clearly see that there was something wrong with me, even by looking at me. So uh, we went to Zambia Hospital and uh, tests, of course, HIV fast because um, everybody thinking maybe she was reckless, negative, and they started me on prednisone, and somehow, in less than three days, I was eating, I was fine. Um, more transfusions and uh, I could get up I wasn't so tired the pain was there but not so much and variably yeah I could understand I could sit for a couple of hours without getting tired and everything so discharge go home and s continue taking what was bread. what was it like after the hospital so you get home get back to some semblance of your normal routine yes yeah, slightly no more better than the the year before and uh, it was a relief so i think at that point i knew there was definitely something medically wrong with me because otherwise if uh, there wasn't anything medically wrong with me the medication wasn't going to work so i kept on and by then um internet wasn't the in thing uh, very few people were accessing it, even um, saying that I'm going to get uh, that and then Google it or anything. It's, it's about, what, 10, 12 years ago? Yeah. Okay. So it wasn't so easy. And uh, I could, um, I read a lot, so I could hit a library, try to look around, like tropical diseases or strange diseases, but nothing really ever came up because you don't know what you're looking for. Yeah. yeah. So. I was in that state of uh, they give you the pre they give you the, the bread and then 
you keep tampering the dosage, you keep coming down. But when we could come from about 60 milligrams to maybe 20, I'd be back to the original pain. And somehow you just keep up there. But of course, uh, this constant medication, it has consequences. Uh, so about three years in, like that, we, uh, I, of course, not everybody left. A couple of good friends stayed behind and they kept asking around. And then my friend Aida, she, I, I, actually she never told me the story of how she got around to finding Dr. Kadu. So she gives me the number, I go to see him. This is how we get to the diagnosis of we come from, yeah. we don't know to now putting exactly. a name to what's but happening. But in between there, you've been to all hospitals and there are others who see you and they do not even want to treat you, but they have no way of telling you to go away because they don't know what they're treating. They're okay. treating the symptoms and they're afraid of making mistakes. And at that point, I was asking questions and they didn't have answers. All right, so we get to Dr. So Kadu. We get to Dr. Kadu and he tells me, it's, I, didn't, I don't even, the first time I met Dr. Kadu, I don't even think we spent more than 20 minutes together. It could have been about 10 because he was very busy and he had a class. So he tells me, you know, I don't want to raise your hopes or not, but from what I can see, there was, I had a patch, a dark patch like around my face. It, it must face like a butterfly, so it's called a butterfly rash. And he tells me, but from what I see, it could be, but I don't want to speculate, you know. So he tells me, you know what, you do the tests, let's wait for the results, and then we can take it from there. So he writes me a couple of tests, and he gives me, excuse me, and then he tells me, you know, I think the only lab that can do this is Lancet Laboratory. They were at uh, Victoria University when they were still in, uh, is it Kamocha or Bukoto? Somewhere there. Kamocha. So uh, I was in uh, Mulago. I decided, why not? Let me go by, find out prices, because I knew I couldn't afford it. I didn't have the money. I hadn't been working for about three years. So I go, get, uh, I get there, show them, ask for and then my total was coming to about 960 or so. Close to a million shillings. Yes, give or take. So I look at it, I go home, I give it to my dad, I tell him, you know what, this is what they, they want me to do. But he was, I don't know whether old school or he Skeptical was tired. from yeah, all of the yeah, yeah, being tossed up and down and everything else. Nobody really knows. You've been through the tests and nothing comes through. And then he said, okay, I'm going to get the money in uh, maybe two, three days. You give me some time. I come up with the money and we'll try. So you got the test done eventually? Yeah, I got the test about three days later. I got the test done and uh, I waited because they were taking the results to South Africa. The, uh, the samples to South Africa, so you have to wait two weeks. I waited and when after the two weeks, results came back. They gave me my results. Called When I was going to pick the, the, the results, I called him. He told me, yeah, same place, please come and bring the results. So I, I didn't even look through, I just made sure my name was on the, I'm getting the right results and yeah. So when I got to him, he's like, okay, Mariam, you have lupus. And I thought, what What's is that? that? So he explains to me, he tells me, it's an autoimmune condition. Your body, your immune system is hyperactive. It is attacking your healthy tissues. Thinking, how does it happen? Is it a virus? Is it a bacteria? Is it a par What? What, what did I wrong? do? No, before you get to the, to, the, to the what did I do, it is, uh, oh, by the way, I think I'd already gone through the what did I do. So he tells me, no, it is genetic to a certain percentage, I think maybe 85%, and then the rest is environmental. It could have been maybe an infection that yeah. triggered it or anything. 
it is not conclusive. And by the way, I think when they're testing for lupus, they don't say, like, we are looking for, let's say, malaria, we are looking for malaria parasites. It is, uh, I think, by exclusion. Like, you cut out a certain a few parameters, and then if it gives you this and this, then lupus. We, we conclude. So he told me it's an autoimmune condition. He started me on hydroxychloroquine and PRED, still continued. And then he told me, with time, we'll keep tampering the dose, or you can even wean off it for a period, and if you're not feeling so good, we can go back. How, how many years has this been since that interaction, and how are you doing now? It could be about 10, 12. And uh, initially, when I started the treatment, things started happening again. I started, my appetite got back, hair loss, I got my hair back a little bit, and um, uh, weight, but the appearance still not so good. I actually had to cut my hair, I was keeping very short hair, and I started to work again. So um, the first five years, I was really you know, trying to stay healthy, trying to find out more about it. I kept disturbing him, thinking maybe it can cure, it can be cured, maybe with a diet, maybe with treatment. But he kept telling me, you know what, Mariam, just take your medication, you know. And with the, medis with the medication, I've been, I've been okay. But uh, sometimes you flare, you flare up and uh, it happens and then you go, you're sick, you're hospitalized. One day, we are talking right now, and then in the later in the night, maybe, ah, she's not okay, we are going to the hospital, chop chop, everything is not so fine, so. You, yeah. you constantly have to have someone living with you to just, um, or are you on your own? Actually, after the diagnosis, I went into isolation, because when you've been around people and you've been helpless and you can do a little bit for yourself and you've started to work again so i was thinking really i need to get a life yeah yeah, yeah. because you're lagging behind and everybody has already moved on you're still on the treatment yes up to now you're still seeing the same doctor yes okay have you understood what's happening with your body better now that you you have a a certain lifestyle that you're keeping to mm -hmm. keep yourself? Yes, um, most of the time it is uh, conserve energy. I do not do unnecessary stuff, like I don't exhaust myself, even if it's housework. If I clean the house and I can't mm. do the dishes, I'll leave it for later. If I, actually, the washing, laundry, I'm at a point where I can't do almost completely. So you constantly need to have somebody with you somebody who understands yeah somebody who is not going to feel like you're cheating or you're just lazy yeah uh-huh you're lazy or when you can you do cheaping when you can't it is useless because if you force it you are going to lose about a week or two trying to make up for those few hours that you couldn't take a break so yeah. and uh, being a parent i have a four-year-old and a seven month old I'm, it is I'm, I'm, I'm coming to that i want to understand <laughs> what explanation you know knowing four year olds and how inquisitive they are but mm. let's take a short break and we'll be right back Welcome back. Thank you for staying with us. We are coming to you from the Kampala uh, Serena Conference Center, the NTV Uganda Studios, and we're speaking about lupus tonight. Mariam is in the studio sharing her story, and you have a four-year-old and a seven-month-old. Yeah. Um, your four-year-old daughter, who I know four-year-olds, lots of questions, you know, lots of jumping and grabbing you. Lots of energy. Uh, yeah. How, how do you deal with that how do you start explaining to her about you know mommy maybe can't play as much or can't do the activity you want to do can't lift you as high as you want yeah. you know and is constantly maybe in pain or sleeping how do you explain that um uh, for a uh, four-year-old of course play is the most important thing but uh, i started from the very beginning knowing that uh, my energy levels are really low 
we do we don't play rough you know we can't run into mommy mommy will not be able to carry you for more than maybe three five minutes at a time uh, we we do gentle gentle things like you can build blocks and uh, given the fact that at some point it was just me and her in the house really I could do small things while she helps uh, bring me a cup, take this there, bring that here. So uh, she, ha she, she was chipping in, of course. Responsible at four. Yes. And uh, she's uh, keeping you active and occupied, you know. Yeah. So it is. But of course, conceiving, um, I had to hide <laughs> because I was afraid of the reaction from my, my dad, especially my family. I was thinking, what are they going to say? This girl is not serious. She definitely wants to kill herself, you know. But did you have a difficult pregnancy? No. I was so normal. I'm actually very okay when I'm pregnant. It is the after that becomes a challenge. Uh, after my girl, I was about, I was hospitalized. I was sick, but I wasn't hospitalized. But the, I think the body is adjusting. To, uh, well, I read about it and it is like, if you are lucky, the lupus might think uh, that pregnancy is uh, something wrong and it will lay off a bit. It is, the huh? it is a bit complicated, really, how it works. Because if I am fine, there is nothing wrong with me, then it, my system is attacking tissues and I am having a child. And at first I was thinking, what if it affects the pregnancy? Yeah, what if you have a deformed child or anything? But so far, she's very okay. She's active, typical for four-year-old. And the seven month that that one is a bit rough. He's still you cannot <laughs> explain, you cannot negotiate, and he's just starting to crawl. So he's really active. But at right now, I have uh, people around who are helping, okay. chipping in, and right. and of course, big sister comes in once in a while. But she's not so so good with kids. She's she would rather play. She just had you. Saying <laughs> that, <laughs> what is life like? Um, you you know you. You mentioned that you're constantly in pain. Yeah. There's a lot of discomfort. Mm -hmm. What is it like for you? Are you in pain now, for example? Yeah, my elbows hurt. <laughs> uh, my toes hurt because uh, today I've been walking around a little bit more than I usually do. So uh, it, it might get a bit worse later in the day or later in the night. Then tomorrow might not be so good, but... And uh, uh, there is, um, this is this is not right, by the way, because when I am in pain, I increase my dose of bread a little bit. And that's not right. You're not supposed that, to be doing that. That is not right. Well, your doctor just had you as well. Yes. Uh, I am sure it is some kind of abuse, I would say. I don't even know whether it is addictive. And of course, if you ask me, I'll say, no, I am not. But even if I am about three hours late taking my medicine, I will feel it. I will know. And I'll have to take it. So that's how bad the pain gets and the discomfort. And you're on medication for the rest of your life? Yeah, for the rest of your life. Uh, you can tamper with it. You can even go off a bit and then come back. But it is there. And then everything that comes with the constant taking of medication it is it is not good it affects your skin the way you look you know yeah yeah so it is not really good and uh, uh, there is no support I mean there is no psychosocial support I was going to ask that yeah, yeah. It, there isn't any organization or anybody uh, as far as I know in Uganda that is coming out and saying we are supporting the past we have um, WhatsApp groups where somebody can post, I'm not okay, I'm feeling this, where you have your doctor on there and you're sharing experiences and uh, a bit, you'll be fine, take it easy, slow down, but you do not get down to uh, talk to somebody. But it's, and it's also important for your families as well. Exactly. Who don't know what to do or how yeah, to help you. Exactly. Who see you as lazy, being unproductive. You are not giving it your whole, but you, you, you're really trying. And there is nothing like, uh, uh, they, nobody is coming up to say, I'm going to support you. It becomes mental. And because 
you of the constant tiredness and whatnot, there is a lot of isolation. So there is a need for awareness, there is a need for psychosocial support. Uh, the tests are terribly expensive. Yeah, yeah. I, 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 so I was wondering about the cost to you. Well, first of all, you had to leave your job. Yeah, the job You can't really do the age to five? Eight to five has really become a challenge because I have since tried and uh, unless your employer is really, really understanding, but there is a certain level at which the person is going to be understand because the uh, businesses monetary, you want to be paid for your yeah. services, yeah, not for your redundancy. So it becomes a bit of a challenge. All right. Um, thank you so much for sharing this story. I, we must, uh, we're getting a doctor to just speak more into what you've shared with us to help us understand lupus mm -hmm. as much as possible. And I think the only time I'd heard about it, and I was telling you earlier, was because a celebrity, <laughs> Tony Braxton, yes. has lupus. And, you know, then I did a bit of reading, but not that much. Yeah. Hearing it from you yeah. and seeing you, you know, listening to you talk about your life and how difficult it can be, I think gives it much more... Um, it helps us understand it a bit more. So thank you for sharing your story. You're welcome. We, we're going to have a doctor explain um, a bit more about what it is, just really looking into how it comes about, what we should do, and also explaining that part about you being pregnant and you're okay. What you're would you welcome. like us to take home from hearing your story? Uh, um, if you're out there and you are not okay physically, your body is telling you you're not fine. It means you're not fine. And forget about the spiritual beats. Forget about, look for answers. Find a doctor. Ask for the tests. If it cannot, the, the person might not suggest, but if you have this idea, ask for a test. If you say it is an autoimmune condition, maybe, suggestively, it will. Because at some point, the people, the medical, the, the hospitals start to see, they see you and they're like, oh, there she is again, and they have nothing for you. But you could become proactive, uh, suggest that maybe you do the screening for an autoimmune condition. It is pricey, but it is worth it. Because at least now you know what you're dealing with. And once you know what you're dealing with, you can manage and you can have a productive life. It won't be super like you're healthy, but it is better than not knowing. Yeah. Yeah. And we're thankful that it's it, you don't have to go to the library anymore. No. To find no information. <laughs> <laughs> Thank you so much for taking the time to speak with us. Um, okay. We're going to speak to a, a doctor who will explain to us what all of this means and just give us some context into you know what lupus is and and what it looks like for somebody who has it. What what the, their options are. Doctor Kadu, thank you for agreeing to this call. Um, I want us to, 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 to give an idea of what lupus is and how it comes about for somebody who's never heard of it and this is their first encounter with it. Basically, lupus is an autoimmune disease uh, which uh, affects the whole body. It can affect the body right from the head to the toe. And by autoimmune disease, I mean a disease which comes about where the immune system goes into overdrive and starts producing substances or it makes the, 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 the immune system start attacking the body parts or body organs subsequently leading to disease and that is what we call lupus. I, when I was speaking to Mariam, uh, one of the things that came about was that it could be genetic as well. There's an element of genetics in the way it comes about, uh, but basically we, we don't know what uh, sets off or what makes the immune system to start behaving the way it does, but what we know is that there's some element of genetics, there's some element of the environment, then uh, other factors have been uh, suggested, uh, things like infections, which usually occur uh, during early childhood, 
things like uh, uh, EBV or Epstein Barr virus infection. Uh, usually, they are self-limiting viral infections, which are, are more common during early childhood, and they are self-limiting. They go away. They don't cause a serious illness in majority of the people. So they, there have been suggestions that they may be the ones which make the, the immune system to go into autodrive and it starts producing antibodies and cells which continue to to attack the body. So genetics, yes, uh, but genetics plays a, 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 a small role because studies have looked at uh, identical twins. One of the twin, one of the twins can can develop lupus, while the other may not develop lupus. So that makes genetics, it, it, it shows that genetics is not a major uh, factor in, in causing the disease. All right. D Dr. Kadu, for somebody who has lupus, what does that look like uh, on them? So usually lupus is a, a disease of exclusion. Uh, and in most cases, by the time we make a diagnosis, the patient has been sick for quite a while, has gone through many hands or has received various treatments, depending on which system is involved at a specific point. Because sometimes they, it may be the blood which may it reduce. Someone develops anemia. They end up receiving transfusion sometime. Then later on, maybe the kidneys fail. So they end up in dialysis or some kind of a, a kidney treatment. Then the other time they develop uh, muscle weakness. The other time they develop uh, skin rash. So something like that. But what we usually do is we get the history of, of, of the patient or the person whom we suspect to suffer from lupus. And we look at all the systems so things like hair loss uh wounds in the mouth uh skin uh discar or skin rash and usually the skin rash is worse when someone works uh either or someone exposes the skin to the sun and the patient will usually tell you that they feel as if the skin is burning when they walk in the bright sun uh, uh, or during the hot seasons. So uh, sometimes they may have a, a disc a coloration over the uh, sun exposed areas on the arms, the cheeks, the face, or the shoulders, depending on what they wear. Then, of course, we talked about uh, muscle weakness or muscle aches or pain. Sometimes they have uh, arthritis where the joints may swell or become painful. Then chest or respiratory system, they may have cough, difficulty in breathing. They may develop uh, a fluid, a pleurofusion, where fluid accumulates in the lungs or in the pleural cavity. Uh, they may have uh, features which may look like TB, where they lose weight, they look sick. Uh, they may have uh, 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 stomach or tummy issues, diarrhea, uh, discomfort, uh, poor appetite, so all those. So those are things which we look out for. Then we make a diagnosis or we suspect that they have the disease then we go ahead to investigate them where we take off a blood sample and we look for specific uh, 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 things within the, the blood we've taken off in the lab and it helps us to confirm that they actually have lupus. Dr. Kadu, where do, what's the percentage of people who have lupus if, if from any research that you've done in Uganda or how big of a problem is it and where do people go for help? 
we 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 have just done a, a small studies mainly they are hospital uh, based studies we have not uh, surveyed the country to actually know how bad the, 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 the disease is. But based on studies from other countries, it ranges at a, maybe about maybe 0.3 to 1% of the general population. So it may be an uh, underestimate or overestimate. But uh, uh, it, the disease does occur within our population. Um, it affects, unfortunately, females more than men, yeah, a ratio of about eight to one. Um, usually it starts early, a little bit early, maybe about 15 to 20 years around there. And when we make the diagnosis and we confirm that they have, or when usually when patients are suspected, usually they are referred to Monago. We have a clinic which now runs, it used to run on Friday in Chirudu, but it shifted back to Monago and it runs on Friday, on Thursday in the morning, uh, Thursday every week. So usually that's where they get treatment from. Could somebody live with lupus and never know they have it? Yes and no. Yes, we have a, a category of of uh, patients who may have mild disease, where they develop mild symptoms, but they have lupus. They they never get overt uh, disease or complications. Then there are those who develop. Uh, serious disease or life-threatening disease, maybe those who have kidney involvement, heart uh, involvement, or the lungs. Usually those ones, we make the diagnosis when they are admitted in hospital and uh, we treat them. How severe can it get? It's, it, it's a life-threatening disease. It might kill you. How is it that uh, Mariam, when she was pregnant, everything mm. was okay? She was absolutely normal from what she says. There are other patients who are suffer from lupus who get pregnant and they deliver no more healthy babies. Uh, but what we need to note is that when you become pregnant, your immune system changes a little bit. So for some patients, it may make uh, the, 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 the disease milder, and after delivery, the disease surfaces again because of the changes in the hormones when you become pregnant. It, it's that one we usually see it in patients who have rheumatoid arthritis, where they are, when they become pregnant, the disease kind of uh, uh, keeps quiet, then wakes up when they deliver. So they, for, 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 for uh, lupus, what we usually worry about is the baby. Uh, sometimes the antibodies may cross the placenta and affect the baby. So the baby may also be born with complications. Is there some kind of psychosocial support for somebody who has lupus? Clinic offers uh, 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 clinical care. And if there's a need of uh, uh, psychological therapy or counseling, usually we send them to the counselors. And the, the patients themselves have formed an association which is under the Arthritis Association of Uganda, where lupus also falls. So they tend to counsel and support themselves uh, and offer solutions depending on their expertise. We, we, we have uh, uh, quite a number and even the patients themselves have a, a WhatsApp group where they share ideas and tend to look out for each other. And 
and it cuts across. Some of them are doctors, others are nurses, others are pharmacists, uh, lawyers, bankers. So they quite a number. So they try to support themselves. We have not yet started uh, talking to families, usually unless if the patient comes in with either the immediate family or a caregiver when they come for treatment, then we talk about the disease, but we do not go out to look out for them. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kadu. Is there anything you'd like us to know as we close this conversation? Um, yes. I uh, Just a call on to all those who bought hydroxychloroquine during the COVID uh, uh, pandemic at the beginning. It's one of the important drugs we use. So if they can donate it to our patients, that would be great. Unfortunately, the, the, drug, the, the, the drug is not part of the essential drug list. So it's not available in the hospitals. Patients have to buy it out of pocket. All right. Thank you very much, Dr. Kadu. Thank you for watching. Uh, coming up is NTV Weekend Edition.